Good afternoon and welcome to Worcester Public Library's monthly nutrition class. These classes and our monthly cooking classes are funded with federal funds from the National Library of Medicine and National Institutes of Health through the University of Massachusetts Worcester. Today we welcome back registered dietitian Judy Palkin for her class, The Timing of Our Calories. Thank you, Judy. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I really appreciate the Worcester Public Library doing this. Will I be able to share my screen now? Let's see. You should be all set. Yes. Can, can you nod if you can see that? Yes. Yes, okay, okay. So I'm really glad that you're all here to join me for the timing of our calories. Um, I chose this topic because it does seem to be that there's benefit to paying attention to not only what we eat, but when. In recent years, there's been quite a bit of attention paid to this, and I want to um, delve into some of the beneficial health effects of eating and limiting what we eat at certain times. I, I am aware that some of you are already playing around with, or not playing, but manipulating the timing of your calories, and I'd, we'd be very happy to hear about it. So if you want to chime in either in the chat box or um, by unmuting yourself, um, you know, at any, you know, at some point, if you want to give us an indication that you want to do that, it might be helpful for people to hear about your experience. And if you haven't been to these classes before, I just want you to know that you'll get an email with an image of the slides. So it's, if it's helpful for you to have the information, you will receive that. And as I'm going along, be thinking of any actions that you might like to take if you feel you need to change around the timing of your calories. So here is the agenda of what I hope to cover. I wanna talk about the health effects associated with the time of day we eat. Um, what does the research say about it? I'll show you a little bit of data. Um, I wanna talk about intermittent fasting. Like, is, is it good? Is it bad? Is it, is it something that maybe you wanna give a try? Um, and then with all that information, I wanna talk about how we can make changes to the timing of our calories. I wanna give you some practical suggestions and you be thinking about what you might wanna do if you wanna make any changes. And of course, I do wanna show you some paintings as I go along. So as I'm presenting, just please start reflecting about your own eating and the timing of your eating. Like, do you eat in the morning? Do you eat breakfast or is it really a struggle for you to get anything in in the morning? Do you eat through the evening to the late hours? Is one of your meals typically the largest? And let me also start by, by asking what is a calorie? I think we all have an intuitive feeling for what a calorie is because for, you know, for our lives, we've heard about calories and we see them listed on food labels. It's simply a unit of energy. So just like a pound, is a, a unit of weight. A calorie is a unit of energy. It's the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So it, it actually is a very tiny amount of energy to raise that one gram of water. So we lump them in batches of a thousand calories and we call that a kilocalorie or our abbreviated KCAL for short. So that's what you see on a label where it says the number of calories. They're actually talking about kilocalories. And here is an example of like a typical snack food, something that people might snack on in the evening, store-bought chocolate chip cookies like Chips Ahoy. And so the serving size is three cookies, according to the manufacturer, and that has 160 kilocalories. So it has 160,000 calories, but don't worry about that. And the question that's more relevant for us is, does it matter when you eat them? So to help me address this question, I wanna introduce Madame Manet. Madame Manet, Suzanne Manet, was the wife of Edouard Manet, the French Impressionist painter, not to be confused with Monet, this is Manet, also equally wonderful. And here she is reclining on a blue sofa. And I wanna say a word about the sofa first before we get back to the question. 
if you look at it's bright blue and then next to it over on the left there it looks like there's a chair of the same fabric and way over on the right it looks like there might be another chair that's blue this was very unusual in a painting throughout the history of art you may have heard that um until pretty recently blue was a relatively rare color in paintings and just check it out if you go to an art museum and you look at old paintings, blue is the least common color because natural pigments that occur in nature, among natural pigments, blue is found the least. They had to crush up lapis lazuli or something often to get blue, and it was very expensive and rare. But since the industrial era, there's more blue pigment. So this was unusual um, with all the blue, and I think it's also a very charming painting. So back to my question about, does it matter when you eat the cookies? Um, I'm looking at Suzanne Manet and I'm thinking she's got a slightly impatient look on her face. So the story we're gonna tell ourselves is that she sent off one of her maids to get some cookies because she likes to eat cookies on her couch and she's waiting for them impatiently. But does it matter whether she eats them at like 11 in the morning or late into the evening? Does it make a difference? And I wanna pose some other kind of quantitative questions along a similar vein before we answer that. If someone gives you $100 to spend at the mall, will you get more if you spend it in the morning versus the evening? Sorry about that. Um, and you, you You'd be right if you said it doesn't matter what time of day you spend it, unless there's some kind of a flash sale going on, the time of day should not matter. It's simple quantitative question. Or if you have to drive 200 miles, does the distance change depending upon whether you drive in the morning or the evening? No, the distance doesn't change. But in terms of your health, is 160 calories in the morning the same as 160 calories at 11 p.m.? And that is not as clear cut. It does seem to be that there is some effect to the time of day when you eat those cookies or anything else. We do have a comment from Corto who says uh, they eat their fruit before 2 p.m. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's, that might be a good habit, okay. So um, this is the traditional wisdom that you might have heard and that certainly I heard and probably learned in graduate school. And we've probably heard this you know, many times over the years. It's just physics. If calories in are more than the calories burned, the result will be that you'll gain weight. And if calories in are less than the calories burned, the result is that you'll lose weight. And so it's that simple. And if the calories in equal the calories out, there's no change in your weight. But the research shows recently that it's more complicated than that. Um, so it's more than just the number of calories in and out. And I wanna show you some, some studies to illustrate that point. There's been a lot of recent research and I'm gonna show you four studies. So please bear with me as I do that because I think they really make the point. So this first study was done in Israel at Tel Aviv University in 2013. And they compared a high calorie intake at breakfast versus at dinner. So this was a really eloquent, simple study design. What they did is they took overweight and obese women with metabolic syndrome, which means they're on a pathway to diabetes and maybe heart disease, and they randomized them into two groups, each receiving 1,400 calories. And by the way, 1,400 calories is really low. I, don't, I wouldn't expect anybody to try to eat that low of a calorie diet, but that's what they did for the study. And they had a group they called the breakfast group they got 700 calories at breakfast, which is a hearty breakfast, 500 calories at lunch and 200 calories at dinner. And then the dinner group, they just flipped that and you had the same food, but you had 200 calories at breakfast, 500 calories at lunch, 700 calories at dinner. And this went on for 12 weeks. And the results, which are in red, showed that the breakfast group had greater weight loss and waist circumference reduction and carb craving and hunger were reduced. So that's good news. 
good metabolic news just by eating a bigger breakfast and shifting the calories to the morning. Second study, um, same group of researchers at Tel Aviv University, and this was more recent. This was 2018. They looked at women and men with obesity and type two diabetes, and they compared two diets over three months. So similar kind of thing. And let me just say that studies like this are difficult to do and expensive. Um, it's hard to control what human beings eat. So sometimes they have to put them like in a metabolic unit at a, at a university or at a hospital and they pay them. And this is very expensive. And that's why these studies are never very long. Like you wouldn't see a study going on like for a year like this that I'm aware of. So anyway, the two groups that you could be randomized into in the one group, you had a big breakfast, an average lunch, and a small dinner. And in the other group, it was six small meals over the day, kind of like you were grazing, which is not really a healthy way of eating, by the way. And the results in red were that the group with the big breakfast had better weight loss, less hunger, and better diabetes control, even while using less insulin. And Dr. Jakubowicz, the lead author said in her comments, our metabolism changes throughout the day. A slice of bread consumed at breakfast leads to a lower glucose response and is less fattening than an identical slice of bread in the evening. It's hard to believe, but that's what they seem to have found. Here's study number three, the effect of evening eating on women. So this was a study out of Columbia University. They looked at 112 women. So this is an easier kind of study. It's perspective. They're just observing them. They're not altering anything about their diet. So they had to record what they ate for a week at the start of the study. And then 12 months later, they recorded it again. And the researchers also looked at their heart health. And what they found was that the women who ate more of their calories in the evening were more prone to having a high, higher body mass index, so they were heavier, higher blood pressure, and poorer long-term blood sugar control. So again, great metabolic effects for eating earlier in the day. And finally, one more study, and this one with men, just to kind of balance things out. So there was this huge study where they were following about 27,000 men over a 16 year period and looking at diet and many health outcomes. And, but so one of the little things they looked at was um, eating breakfast and the risk of heart disease. And they found that eating breakfast was associated with a significantly lower risk of heart disease. And the men who skipped breakfast had a 27% higher risk of coronary heart disease so chest pain, heart attack, than those who did not skip breakfast. And the men who ate late at night had a 55% higher risk of cardiovascular disease compared to the men who, who did not. So moral of this story or study is eat breakfast, don't eat late at night, at least on a regular basis. There are many other studies, but I, I think you get the idea by seeing those four and other research has shown other health benefits associated with getting more of your calories earlier in the day. So for anyone who has gastroesophageal reflux or heartburn, you might know that if you eat early and don't eat a lot in the evening, you feel better. You don't have that indigestion when you lie down and go to sleep. Better energy level through the, through the day by eating earlier, better sleep, and better mood and brain functioning. So that's a lot of benefits. We do have a, a comment from Hannah just about the small sample sizes of the um, of some of the studies. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's true for the interventional studies where they randomize them and all change something. They are going to be small numbers of people because they're expensive to do and hard to hard to retain people. I'm betting that they had more people initially and some drop out, you know, but it is true. Yeah, and, and, and it's always good to have more than one study because with a, you know, a small sample size, you can never be exactly sure. Um, okay, but thank you, Hannah. So um, we might wonder how, uh, how might eating a substantial breakfast 
help with our weight control. And there's a few things that have been put forward as ideas to how this might work. It seems that eating a substantial breakfast can help to curb our evening overeating. It helps to reduce our cravings and give us a feeling of control. And again, it's, it's, it's kind of neat to think that what you're eating in the morning can affect your cravings in the evening, but that's what some of the research has shown. It seems to activate the satiety system for the day. So in particular, there's a hormone called ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone. And um, if we have a nice high protein intake in the morning with breakfast, it seems to reduce the levels of that hunger hormone, ghrelin. And eating a lot of our calories late in the day may interfere with our circadian rhythms, which is kind of like our 24 hour cycle of biological functions. And that includes um, regulating the activity of enzymes and hormones that control our metab metabolism. So it kind of, that's to say it messes up with that if we eat a lot of calories late in the day. So um, I hope I've made the case so far that it seems to be of benefit to, if you're not already doing it, to shifting maybe more of your calorie intake to early in the day as opposed to later in the day, which by the way is the opposite of the way that most people seem to eat. So I get that this is not intuitive or easy. Are there any comments or questions at this point? Uh, go ahead, Carolina. Hi, I don't wanna get too off topic because I know you have um, the layout of what we're doing today, but I work night shift and I was wondering how, how does someone consider what is my night and what is my day when I live opposite of what most people live? Yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, I think obviously you have to be eating when you're awake. So you, yeah. would, you would just have to, you know, flip this and, and put it during your awake time and maybe, maybe try having more of the calories during the beginning of what's your awake time and tapering down. I'm speculating. I don't know of any research, yes. um, okay. but I, I, yeah, you'd have, you'd have to give that a try. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for asking the question. Go ahead. Um, Kathy has a question as well. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, mine has to do with breakfast. If will it just take time to get used to it? I, I would almost have to force myself to eat breakfast. I'm just so used to not eating until almost lunchtime. Yeah, um, I appreciate that comment, Kathy. And I'm going to get to what I hope might be some helpful suggestions about that, but you're not alone. A lot of people feel that way. So I appreciate the comment and maybe articulating what other people might be thinking. Is there anybody else or should I move on into intermittent fasting? Oh, I can't hear you. Okay, so now I do want to talk about intermittent fasting, which is another way of adjusting the timing of our calories. And this has got a lot of attention in recent years. There's, there are different varieties of intermittent fasting, but the two most popular types are what are called the 5-2 format and time-restricted feeding. So I'm going to talk about both of those. And so just in this one slide about the 5-2 format. So um, as you know, there are seven days in every week. So somebody following the 5-2 format would fast for two days. And by that, um, it's generally not, not meant to be a total fast, but many people allow themselves something like a meal, something in the neighborhood of 500 calories. And these days are non-consecutive. So you don't fast on Tuesday and Wednesday, you space them out during the week. And then on the other five days, these people kind of have their normal caloric intake. So here's what I wanna say about this. It can help with weight control. There are many people who have helped to control their weight using this because it just seems more maybe palatable to people 
to have a few days a month where they're really limiting their intake, but not having to worry about calories every day of the week and always chronically trying to restrict them. So for some people, it has worked very well. However, um, the, a person's nutrient intake might end up being inadequate because every day we're supposed to get all of our nutrients ideally, like all of our protein and our good fats and our fiber and our vitamins and minerals. So it's, it would be hard on those two days um, unless somebody is extremely careful to get everything they need in that very small amount of food. And it puts a lot of burden on the other five days to try to eat really nutrient dense foods. Not saying it can't be done, but I just think um, a, a person needs to be careful doing that. And this is certainly not for anyone with diabetes who's on medication to lower their blood sugar because you're already lowering your blood sugar with medication and then you're gonna restrict your calorie intake. You could go too low and become dangerously hypoglycemic. So you don't want that to happen. But yet it is, again, something that has helped many people. So I don't want to discount it at all. And to introduce the next other common type of intermittent fasting, I'm gonna read you a letter that was in the Wall Street Journal almost a year ago. So on Saturdays in the Wall Street Journal, there's this uh, column written by a guy named Dan Arelli. I think I'm saying that right. And um, if you ever have access to it, his column is fun. He's actually not a health writer. He writes about workplace etiquette and workplace struggles. And so somebody wrote into him, somebody named Julie wrote into him and bear in mind, this was during the pandemic. She wrote, dear Dan, working from home for the last, last few months has been bad for my eating habits. Yeah, <laughs> since it's so easy to snack throughout the day. I've gained weight and I wanna go on a diet, but I'm still working at home, so the temptations aren't going away. What diet would work best in this situation, Julie? And he said, planning a healthy diet is even harder now than usual, since going to the supermarket is more difficult and some ingredients are harder to get. To make things easier, try intermittent fasting, where you can eat anything you want for eight hours a day, but fast for the other 16. Research shows that diets are easiest to keep when they have clear and simple rules like this one. So this is our introduction to time-restricted feeding. Um, I like, I was impressed that he said this. He's right about diets being easiest to follow as if they're clear and simple. Where I think he might have missed the mark is, I don't agree with the advice that you should eat anything you want during those eight hours, because there are people that take this very literally and go on the bacon cheeseburger diet during those eight hours, and that can't be good. It can be done. You can eat terrible foods for those eight hours, and you, you might even lose weight, but you're not doing yourself any favor health-wise. And also, I think when he was saying that it's very hard during the pandemic because it's hard to get ingredients, you know, I think the, the main thing that's hard about it for people working from home or just stuck at home is the constant access to the refrigerator and the pantry. Although I do know that there were some people that had or have trouble finding foods. So let's look at what this time restricted feeding is. Just like he implied in his column, it means generally that you consume all your food within an eight hour window and that you fast for the remaining 16 hours except non-caloric beverages. So for example, many people interpret this as, okay, I'll eat from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then I stop until 10 a.m. the next morning. But they do, very often people will say, okay, but I will allow myself plain tea or plain decaf coffee or seltzer, definitely water. Um, some people expand this to include like, you know, diet beverages. You, you can kind of make your own rules. Um, this actually is a really good, uh, a good technique, I think, this time-restricted feeding. It can solve the problem of grazing for many hours over the day, which is generally not a good thing if people are grazing for 16 or 18 hours a day. 
Um, people tend not to graze on broccoli. That's not what people usually graze on. So it's, you know, it's better if, if it helps you to just confine it to eight hours a day. I think it's something that is well worth trying. It's like a good tool in the toolbox of trying to control weight um, and blood sugar. Some people recommend a longer or shorter window for eating. Like if you Google this, you'll see that there's people that recommend a 10 hour window, that's fine. What I don't like is the really short window. There's a whole movement online to have a four hour window for eating. That's in my mind ridiculous to try to eat all your food in four hours. That can't be healthy in any way. Um, but you know, people like to take things to extremes. I think the eight hour window sounds very reasonable. Um, and it's, it might be worth a try for some of you if you're looking for something like that. Any questions or comments on that before I? Uh, Carol, yeah. Uh, my son-in-law does that intermittent, but he does it in a four hour block. He does? Thing is, yeah, but the thing is he does it for a while then he goes back to eating normally uh -huh. and the weight comes back and then he goes back on the four hour window for a couple of weeks. <coughs> so it, it would be my, my thing is that if you choose to do it, you have to be consistent with it, not go crazy for two weeks and then go back and forth. And Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that's why somebody being more moderate and following the eight hour window or even nine or 10 is more likely to have long-term success. Um, I think that part of the beauty is I think probably we've evolved to eat in a restrictive time. Our distant ancestors were probably not up late at night eating. I bet they went to sleep when it got dark. You know, what else are you gonna do? <laughs> so, so, We've evolved that way and it makes sense, but a four hour window, you can't sustain that for a long time, or at least probably most people couldn't, including your son-in-law, but probably you shouldn't be the one to tell him that, right? <laughs> okay. We do have a comment from Jean. It seems that the 10 hour window is basically what we should do anyway if we don't eat in the evening. I agree, I agree, it just makes sense. And reading about this and putting this together, I've become really inspired to, you know, try to limit the time frame of my eating. And I think 10 hours should be pretty doable for, you know, for most of us. And eight hours if you're, you're, you know, so inclined. So I have a question: Is this, um, is this restricted, you know, time restricted feeding something you should be doing every day, or can you just do it a couple of times a week? Um. I think if you seriously are trying to work on controlling your weight or getting your blood sugars down or whatever it is, I think the more consistent you are doing it every day, the better. But having said that, we do not need to be perfect. We don't. And I'm going to talk more about that at the end. We don't need to be perfect. So if you found yourself able to do it a few times a week, but not every day, I still think there would be benefit. Okay. Yeah. Um, we do have a question from Kathy. Go ahead, Kathy. Yes, we were talking before about breakfast. So does this mean like for eating from 10 to 6, 10 o'clock would be your breakfast? And then would that still mean you want three meals in that eight hour window? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yes, it, it would mean that. And, and, you know, that might be challenging. And so some people might want to shift that down. Like if you're someone who would prefer to eat earlier, you might want to make that from nine to five or shift it in any way you want. And if that was too hard to get the three meals in the eight, eight hours, you might be someone who would do better with a nine or 10 hour window. Okay. Thank you, you really need to customize this to yourself and to what works for you if you're going to try it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Here's a Van Gogh sketch um, of a young man with a cup in his hand. So let's just imagine that he's finished his eight hour window. So he's allowing himself his cup of tea and he's telling himself, don't worry, tomorrow morning breakfast will come and I'll get to eat again. Cause sometimes we have to talk ourselves out of eating in the evening. So this could be any of us. 
And let me show you one study that looked at intermittent fasting with the time-restricted diets. Um, this was at Queen Mary University in London um, this year, actually published. And they looked at 50 overweight adults and they told them to confine their day daily eating period to eight hours per day. And during the remaining 16 hours, they could have any variety of beverages with no calories. And I like that they got to choose the eight hour period that was most convenient for them. And this went on for 12 weeks. And the results in red, those who adhered for at least five days per week had greater weight loss than those with lower adherence. So compelling. So um, now I wanna talk with, all, with this knowledge that we have about time of day of eating and inter intermittent fasting, what can we do? What changes can we make? Like, let's say we're not gonna follow a strict intermittent fasting regimen. What changes can we all try to make? So of course I'm gonna say, try to have more of your calories early in the day based on those studies that I showed you where people did better metabolically and with their weight. So here you have the typical pattern of the way Americans tend to eat, although of course there's a lot of variation, but a lot of people in our society have a very small breakfast or no breakfast at all, kind of a medium lunch and a big dinner. And a lot of this goes back to childhood where we just grew up thinking that dinner was the event meal and like, mom, what are we having for dinner? And there might be several different foods and even different courses. Um, and that in itself isn't a bad thing. Like, you know, if you are familiar with French eating, there's often different courses to a French meal, but they're very small. But, you know, our US pattern is for a big dinner in the evening. So what we should do ideally is try to flip this and eat more in the morning and taper down as the day progresses. You might've heard, eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a pop, prince and dinner like a pauper. So that kind of sums it up. It does help with weight loss and heart health and diabetes control. It does seem to. So let's talk about what gets in the way of eating a good breakfast, because a lot of people really do struggle with it. So some people say, I don't have time. I have to work, I have other responsibilities, I'm in charge of other people, whatever. Or people might say, I get wrapped up in things and I forget to eat and I look at the clock and it's noon or one o'clock and I, I haven't eaten. And, and you know, this happens all the time. And that actually might be a good thing if you like what you're doing so much and you get all wrapped up in it. Um, but, you know, things that might help are planning something the night before, like planning what, even in your mind, what you're going to have for breakfast and having some simple breakfast ideas. It doesn't have to be complicated. Not everybody wants to get up and make waffles from scratch and a variety of different things for breakfast, but you might have some simple breakfast things that you can go to. Some people, you know, they may have the time, but people get very entrenched in their routines. So some people get up in the morning, brush their teeth, get dressed, hop on their computer, and that's it, you know, until the afternoon. So People have established routines, but those routines can be tweaked and altered if we put our minds to it. Some people are genuinely not hungry in the morning. I've heard this from a lot of people and sometimes I've experienced it myself. Maybe you just want coffee, maybe a slice of toast or a piece of fruit, but you don't want anything else. So if you feel this way, don't despair, don't give up. If you start to eat a smaller dinner, the problem might solve itself organically. You just might, might start to wake up hungrier because you didn't need as much the night before and you just kind of shift naturally over to a slightly bigger breakfast as you eat a smaller dinner. It's worth a try anyway. We do have a question in the chat. Um, yeah. I'll ask the second part first because it kind of pertains to the morning here. Um, do you recommend drinking a glass of warm lemon water first thing in the morning within a half hour of waking? 
okay, I, it's not that I go around recommending it, but I think it's a fine idea. I don't think there's anything magical about it, but I think that it's a way of getting in some good fluid. The lemon is good for us. I find it to be, when I've done that, I find it to be very tasty and enjoyable. So I think it's a great idea if you like it. And then uh, the second question she had was, um, is green tea best to drink? Is there a best tea to drink? Oh yeah, I have a tea class. I need to give that again. Uh, from a health standpoint, all real tea is really good for us. And green tea seems to have the most health effects. Black tea is good, but green tea is outstanding. Yep. Okay, so ideally, if we're going to try to eat breakfast, you know, this is the ideal, you don't have to be perfect, but here's some components of a really healthful breakfast. You have a whole grain, like maybe you have a cereal that has a whole grain in it or something like that. Um, you have a fruit and or a vegetable and with vegetables, the more the merrier, <laughs> they're so good for us. But it might be that you make a smoothie and you include fruit and or vegetables in it. Um, you have a healthy fat of some kind, like maybe you use olive oil and the cooking of something, or maybe you have some nuts and that would be a healthy fat. And you have a food with protein. Protein, we need it at every meal, ideally. And remember, it can help to activate or help us to produce less of that hunger hormone. So we should try to aim, if you're looking at food labels, we should try to aim for at least 20 grams of protein per day. And it doesn't all have to come from one food because the other foods like the vegetables and the grains have a little bit of protein. But like if you have one something that's got high protein in it, like for example, yogurt or cottage cheese, that can be really good. So let me show you some paintings to show you some of the um, breakfast type foods that are good. Here's a beautiful Van Gogh wheat field with corn flowers from 1890 and whole wheat, whole wheat something like whole wheat bread or um, if you know the hot cereal wheatina, that's whole wheat, that, that would be a good thing to include in a healthy breakfast. And as far as fruit goes, so here's a painting by Robert Spear Dunning. Um, this is, um, they know it's from the 1800s. They don't, I don't think they have an exact date on it, but it's at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem. I, I feel sure a lot of you have been there. And this beautiful painting has a pear and a peach and some grapes. All fruit is healthful. All fruit has great fiber and vitamins and phytochemicals. So choose what you like. It's great to get vegetables at breakfast. Not everybody thinks of vegetables at breakfast, but it's a great idea because they're just so good for us. Um, this is this uh, man, this artist Martiros Sarian um, was an Armenian artist. And I don't know, I'm looking at the peppers and thinking peppers could go really well in some scrambled eggs or an omelet. Peppers are actually good in a fruit smoothie and peppers could go in a little breakfast salad and cooked squash like cooked pumpkin um, can go really well in pancake batter or a little bit in a smoothie is really good. So we can get those veggies in. And by the way, those oh. veggies are actually fruits anyway, but never mind. We do have a question from Kathy. Go ahead, Kathy. Yes, in the screen before you said Food with protein at the start of the day, aim for at least 20 grams. Is that for the whole day, 20 grams or just- Oh, I'm sorry. That's a good question, Kathy. No, I meant at breakfast. At breakfast, all right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do have a couple more questions in the chat about tea. So I, I think we do have to have your tea class. <laughs> I would love to. Um, <laughs> but um, from Jean, I'm concerning tea. What about those who are very sensitive to caffeine? Even decaf has trace amounts. so. She tries to drink only herbal teas. Are they not as beneficial? Okay, so um, first of all, decaf tea would have very little caffeine. So you'd have to be really sensitive to notice that <laughs> caffeine, but it could be. Some people are that sensitive. So herbal teas are vary in their health because herbal tea just means it's from a plant and it could be from the twigs or leaves or roots of some kind of plant. So it depends on the plant. In general, herbal <laughs> teas have some health properties because foods from plants do, um, but they, they haven't been shown to have um, the health benefits that regular tea from the tea plant have. 
but that doesn't mean they're not good for us. And they, you know, they provide us with some nutrients and some benefit and good fluid. And that, you know, holding that warm cup of something in the evening can be really nice if we're trying not to eat. Um, and then Carol asks if you have any thoughts about white tea. White tea is great. White tea is part of the continuum, you know, from, uh, I'm trying, I can't, I'm not remembering the exact order, but there's, you know, green tea and white tea and black tea and, and, and so on. Um, and white tea is, is one of those. It's not very oxidized, I believe, unlike black tea. Thank you. Sure. Okay, and one more painting pertaining to breakfast foods. Um, so just take this in for a moment because it's very rich in detail. This is from 1618, Diego Velazquez, um, a Spanish painter. Um, and I just love all the detail. I love how it shows us the cooking implements from back then and the people, I don't know who these people were. Um, it's probably lost to history. So we don't know if she's, um, if she is the young man's mother or grandmother or who, um, but I don't actually think she looks that old. I think she looks careworn, like life was hard. Um, but anyway, she's cooking eggs and that is a, a valuable source of protein as a breakfast food. And here's my recipe for healthy banana pancakes. There are actually a lot of banana pancake recipes floating around online and um, they tend to be healthier than regular pancakes. There's not a lot of flour. Um, it's mostly the mashed banana, the beaten egg. And then in my recipe, I do include a little bit of either flour or oats or cornmeal and you can mix and match those any way you want. Um, and you can add anything you want, berries, any kind of nuts. These I think are delicious and very helpful and just a nice breakfast idea. Okay, so as we make breakfast more substantial, remember we're also trying to make dinner smaller. So how can we do that? These are some tried and true techniques that you've probably all heard, but they work. Any of these can really help you to make your dinner smaller. If you use a smaller plate, um, studies have shown that people like to fill the plate they have. So if you use a smaller plate, you might be likely to take less food. Um, so you might have what's called a luncheon plate or a salad plate. You could try using that. Um, you could serve yourself and then take a few minutes to put the food away. If there's other food, put it back into the refrigerator um, and that way you might be less likely to take more. The only time I can see this might be a problem is if you're eating with other people, you might need to explain to them how you need to put the food away. Um, and if nothing else, just maybe reduce your carb portion at dinner, like your bread or your pasta, even that would be, you know, even just doing that would be of benefit in making your dinner smaller. and avoid eating at night. We should, for the most part, try to avoid eating at night. Um, so here's some guidelines. Stop after dinner. You could just have a rule for yourself that unless there's a special occasion or something, just stop after dinner. Some people say, and I've heard people have great success with saying, I stop after 7 p.m. Or if you're somebody that eats a very late dinner for some reason, 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. or whatever time your dinner ends, you stop. Um, for certain, don't get up and eat during the night. And I'm only saying that because some people do. But um, you know, if you're so hungry, if you're lying there and you're so hungry that you know you're not going to fall back asleep, then you need to eat. And that tells you that you're not eating enough during the day. But otherwise, don't get up and eat during the night just because you wake up and you're you're bored and you're thinking about ice cream, don't do it. Don't get in that habit. It's a bad path to go down. We're meant to fast for a period of every day. Um, herbal tea or decaf tea is okay anytime. Um, you know, you might want to get yourself some special teas if you're, if you're trying to avoid eating at night. Um, and realize that eating after dark may cause us to gain weight. 
um, researchers think that the decrease in daylight signals our bodies to start winding down. So yeah, again, that's how our ancestors were. Um, a while ago, like maybe over a year ago, I put on my Facebook nutrition blog, what do you eat in the evening? And these are the answers that I got from people. Um, and none of this is surprising. Um, pe many people said they eat ice cream or frozen yogurt. Um, many people said crackers and or cheese. Um, also popcorn, pretzels, in fact, anything salty or crunchy. Um, celery with peanut butter. Uh, one lady said chamomile tea and cookies, raisins, chocolate chips. So people eat a great variety of foods in the evening. And you know, some of these aren't so unhealthful and all of them should be allowed uh, in our diets at various times if we want them. You know, like the celery with peanut butter, if someone said they were having that at lunch or as an afternoon snack, that sounds great. But it's in the evening that we just don't wanna be sitting there and munching. And many people indicate, I eat great all day, but then it falls apart in the evening. So how, what can we do about that? Why do we eat in the evening? There's so many reasons, but I think this captures a lot of them. We get cravings. Um, we're kind of wired to really enjoy sweet and fatty and salty foods. And when these are put together in combinations like cookies or potato chips, they can be really hard to resist and we might spend a lot of time thinking about them. If we happen to be watching TV in the evening, we might see commercials for food and these are always really enticing processed foods, whether it's a restaurant or a type of snack cracker or something, you don't see commercials for lentils. Not that lentils aren't good, I think they're great, but that's not what you're seeing commercials for. We, we tend to have a lack of structure, many of us in the evening. During the day, we might have more of a routine and then the evening comes and we're like, okay, now I have some time, let me just eat. <laughs> Um, eat, eating is a way to relax and unwind. And we might feel hungry. And if you feel hungry, just like during the night, that means you're not eating enough during the day. So you want to make sure you get more food in during the day. Another thing might be that we just have entrenched habits. Like we've always done it this way. I always eat ice cream in the evening, or I always have a bowl of cereal before bed. Um, or sometimes we link activities. So it might be that, you know, we go and sit in our favorite chair after dinner, turn on the TV and eat ice cream. And those activities are linked together. Or I read a book and I have to eat my potato chips when I read the book. Or you converse with somebody and you have to eat cookies while you're doing that. But with, with work, with effort, we can kind of change these habits and unlink these activities. This I think is an adorable painting by, um, I am so gonna murder his name, but Kmeti Janos, he was a, a Hungarian artist, reading Woman on Sofa. So just like Madame Manet, this could be any of us, like in the evening, curling up with a book, and does she or does she not decide that she needs to have a snack the whole time she's reading that book? And I have great sympathy for anyone who struggles with that. I've always enjoyed reading while I'm eating, eating while I'm reading. But you know, maybe the key here is treat yourself to a book that you really, really will enjoy, curl up, get comfortable, and just try to savor the book. It's important that we have a plan so that we can say the kitchen is closed, off limits. Or maybe you'll go in there for your hot beverage, or maybe you'll go in there to clean up, but the kitchen's closed in terms of eating. I honestly think it's easier if we have a rule for ourselves that we mostly follow. So some other tips. Be sure to nourish yourself really well during the day. Food is for enjoyment and food is to nourish us and take good care of yourself during the day before it gets to be evening. Even before dinner, map out a plan for what your evening activity is gonna be. Are you going to read? 
Are you gonna do a Netflix thing and watch a lot of TV or Netflix? Are you gonna do some work? Cause you have to catch up on work. What are you gonna take a walk? Plan out your evening and maybe even make your tea if you're gonna have tea or whatever. Um, things go better when you have a plan. And think about it when you're doing your shopping, don't buy certain foods. Like if there's certain foods that you know get you every time in the evening, think about not bringing them into the house very often. Um, we may need to ask ourselves, am I searching for something besides food? Am I using the food as a reward for my hard work? Am I using it as a way to reduce stress? And if this is the case, we need to rethink what else we can do as a reward for ourselves or a way to reduce stress. Some other pleasant activity, something we might buy ourselves, something besides the food. We also should make sure that dinner is very satisfying. You might find that you're less likely to go seeking things in the evening if you've had a nice dinner. So it should have pleasing flavors and a nice appearance, a nice setting, you know, ideally at a table. <laughs> um, I like to have a pop of sweetness, like especially in a salad. I find that putting raisins or berries in a salad takes the edge off the craving for sweetness. It might not take it away altogether, but it kind of takes the edge off, especially I find if you have the salad last in the European way, so then you can linger over that salad that has the sweet ingredients in it. And sure, dessert. If you want dessert, that can be part of your dinner, but I recommend you make it part of the dinner. Like you eat, you have the dessert, then you close the kitchen. Um, also after dinner, here's some other things that you can do that might be helpful. You might want to start your breakfast prep for the next morning. So you might, you know, set something out, um, whatever, assemble some ingredients that will remind you that you are going to eat again. You're going to eat. You're just going to have some time without eating in, in between. You might want to go brush your teeth because when we brush our teeth, we might be hesitant to undo that by eating and then we have to brush them again before we go to bed. And you might wanna get ready for bed if showering, putting on night clothes, getting all ready for bed gets us in a frame of mind that we're done with the eating part of the day. And if all else fails, go to bed. So like, let's say it's 1030 at night and you feel like I gotta have ice cream. I need to have ice cream. I really want ice cream. Just go to bed, <laughs> go to bed and don't think about it. And here's a pretty Pierre Bernard painting. Um, so if you look at the sky, I like to think it's getting dark out. And this lady is setting up her, her, some of her dishes and the fruit for the next morning for her breakfast. We can do that too. So I did say I was gonna address this. Um, does this have to be all or nothing? Like, you know, you might be thinking, this is too tough for me. I can't eat a hearty breakfast. Um, I can't give up eating in the evening. So maybe you'll have a compromise where you say, I will stop eating after one evening snack, or I can manage to eat a small breakfast. I do believe that it's better to take some steps in the timing of our calories than none. I don't think that we need to be perfect. So if all these suggestions don't work for you, find maybe what you can do and there will probably be some benefit to it. So now I'd love to hear if anybody has thought of anything they might wanna do, you might wanna do to change the timing of your calories for your health. So I wanna say thank you and I'm gonna stop the share. Um, let's see, it's always challenging. So we can see each other there. And if anybody wants to chime in either in person or over the chat with what you might do or what you are doing, feel free. Oh, Kathy says, thank you, she has to go. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for your contributions. I can make a comment. I did lose weight on the um, intermittent fasting, the 5-2. Yeah, lose weight. 
Um, and I was thrilled with that. But I really like the idea of that eight hour window. Even. Yeah, I am going to give that a try. I think that will help with my ridiculous eating habits sometimes that I have of just that six small meals a day. And I know that's not really healthy. So um, I'm going to give that eight hour thing a shot and have, well, I almost always have breakfast. That I do have, but I can also have a big dinner. So I need to, I need to kind of balance that. I yeah. Think. And, and for some people, two meals works or two meals yeah. and a little snack. So yeah, you, you might want to give that a try. I think that's yeah. a good idea, Elaine. Yeah. yeah, that's the plan. Yep, okay. <laughs> Thanks. So we, have a, we have a comment from Kate. Um, always eating lunch before my daily cello practice helps setting a schedule for all meals. Good, yep. Routines, plans. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody else have anything to share? Uh, when I went on Weight Watchers, now it's 15 months ago, um, I try to cut out all my cues. So I have no junk in the house except what my husband buys. And since he likes a lot of things that I hate, that works. And I got rid of, I know people don't consider this, but I, cheese, but I had, I used to eat about a pound and a half of American cheese a week. So I have no cheese in my house that I like. Yeah. Well, he does, but I, I won't eat it because it's got too much fat and too many, too many calories, at least. So those are the changes I made. The one thing I have trouble giving up though is like I like fruit at night. Is fruit? that fruit? You could do a lot worse than that, Carol. I think you did great with the cheese. I mean, round of applause for that. You don't have to give up everything and fruit is really healthy. And if it's working for you to have that in your routine, I mean, sure, if you wanted to try to shift it earlier in the day, that would be good, but. No, that's my television stuff. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's the a cup of, a cup of grapes from, that are frozen, <laughs> takes away the, the ice cream. Okay. I think you got yourself a good compromise there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a comment from Jean and she says, many houses now are designed around the kitchen, I guess that open concept type thing, uh, yeah. which makes it harder to avoid eating. I have two paths to the bedroom and try to take the one that doesn't go through the kitchen. Yes, good, good. Yeah. Just putting ourselves out of the way of the temptation. Yeah. yeah. It would be also uh, better to move television from near the kitchen, living room away from the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. And many people have the television in something like a family room that's right next to the kitchen. Exactly. Yeah. I did have a lady in one of my groups who said that in the evenings she would kind of um, decamp to her bedroom where she had like some kind of a little desk or something. And it was purely to get away from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Yeah. We are so fortunate with our great abundance of food. Yeah. I mean, some parts of the world, they would love to have this problem, but it is a problem that we, we have so much food around. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you, Judy. Thank, Thank you. you, Hannah. Thank you, everyone, right. for, for coming and for contributing. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Alex says, thank you, Judy and Jen and WPL as usual. I learned a lot. Kate says, thank you. Jean says, thank you very much. Anybody else have any other questions or comments? We got a ditto from Elaine. <laughs> All right, then. Oh, and a thank you from Hannah. Well, if there's nothing else, I think um, I'm going to stop the recording here. Thank you.